Hi everyone, welcome to the final seminar in the School of Health Information Sciences Health Terminology Standards Seminar Series for June and July. My name's Linda Bird. Um, I'm one of the instructors with, for the Health Terminology Standards Certificate Program, and I'm delighted to be here today with a good friend of mine, Derek Ritz, who's our guest, guest speaker for today. Hello all. <laughs> but before we get started, uh, let's begin with our territory acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wasanich peoples whose historic relationship with the land continues to this day. Just a reminder that this seminar series is delivered part of the final course in our Certificate in Health Terminology Standards Program. If you're interested in joining the next intake that starts in September, you have a couple of days until July 15th to enrol in the next intake. Um, we have had a great lineup of speakers uh, so far. We have heard about primary care systems improvement, nursing data standards, uh, the Alberta Health Services, and last week we heard from Alejandro Lopez Asonio on um, STEM and CT trends and latest developments. But today um, we're very pleased to have Derek Ritz um, from the EC Group Inc., who will be presenting on computable care guidelines. Um, Derek Ritz is a um, principal consultant of the EC Group, Inc., a Canadian professional services firm that provides advisory services to domestic and international public and private sector clients regarding digital health strategy, architecture, standards, implementation and adoption. He's been an advisor to large-scale digital health infrastructure projects in Canada and over a dozen countries in Southern Africa, the Middle East and Asia, some of which I've had the pleasure of meeting Derek in. Um, Derek served two terms as Canada's liaison to the IHE International eHealth Standards Organization. He's a delegate of Canada to ICTC215, the health informatics um, group, and is a FIRE Foundation founder. He is a co-founder and active contributor to a donor-funded initiative, uh, Open HIE, whose mission is to improve the health of the underserved through the open collaborative development and support of country-driven large-scale health information sharing architectures. Um, please note that this session will be recorded and shared on the school's website. Uh, please use the chat box to type in questions or comments throughout today's session. Uh, and there will be uh, time at the end to get your quest questions answered. I'm sure Derek would be very happy to do that. So with that, I'm very pleased to pass the screen over to Derek um, and look forward to your presentation, Derek. Thank you. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. And I'll be sharing my screen now, yeah? Yeah. Do you have to stop, Linda, before I can start? Yeah. Uh, no, you should just be able to pick it up, but I will stop just No, nope, it's all right. I, think I, I was just able to do that. Okay, Wonderful. and if I can just get a quick check that, yes, I am sharing what I think I'm sharing. The smart digital health. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, I will begin by saying how intimidating it is to follow such a great collection of speakers that you've had on this uh, on this lecture series already, I see some uh, some dear friends there who I know to be considerably smarter than me, um, but I'll, I'll do my best to not let the team down. Uh, my topic, I actually am not uh, sticking uh, laser focused on computable care guidelines because of the context within which I'd like to be able to talk about them. And broadly, um, the WHO has, uh, has branded their computable care guidelines initiative smart guidelines. And so I want to talk about smart digital health. And uh, you know what, I'll just carry on through my slides rather than talking to the title slide. Uh, as an agenda, I'm just going to talk a little bit about who I am, because it will be a, uh, a disclosure of biases and uh, give you a sense of why I was invited to present today. Um, I'm then going to use a bit of storytelling to talk about the challenge that's before us. And the storytelling is going to be from uh, some of the low and middle income country work that Linda and I did uh, uh, some years ago together in the Asia Pacific region. But I'll pick a story from there just to give us a, a context that we can uh, 
that we can have a, a shared a shared way of talking about what it is we're going to be talking about. And then I'll talk about how digital health makes an impact on health. And I know that that's a, a kind of a broad brush strokes statement, but there's a particular aspect of process control that I want to introduce, and I just want to set that up a little bit. And then, and this is a complete indulgence on my part. Um, some weeks ago, I was speaking at Canada's National eHealth Conference, uh, and I was talking about AI and how we're going to regulate AI when it's used in this in a, a healthcare context. I'm a member of uh, the working group at ISO that's figuring out how we'll do regulation of uh, AI-based software products. And so that's going to be blah, 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 AI, blah, 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 blah. Uh, just because it seems you can't uh, swing a hockey stick without running into four startups who are all doing AI in healthcare. And then, and then we'll have uh, time for questions and answers, unless I'm too slow, in which case, sadly, there won't be much time. So this is the introductory part that, that I mentioned. And uh, as Linda said, I, I work as, a, as an advisor. Um, I... I think I should probably let you know I'm a recovering engineer. I'm in a 12-step program. I'm coming along very nicely, uh, but I'm not fully recovered. I do have a bit of a geeky side, and at the bottom of the right-hand side, um, you can see that I, I am a delegate of Canada to ISO TC215, which is the Technical Committee for Health Informatics. And, you know, I got a chance to meet and work with some lovely people there, uh, Linda included. I'm a Fire Foundation founder. I've I've uh, I've been a, a, a technical committee chair, and I've been Canada's representative to the IT International Board, and that's another standards development organization. I've done domestic work here in Canada. Um, I've been either on the front burner, or on the front channel, or on the back channel, uh, participating in six or so provincial jurisdictional um, implementations. The bulk of the work, though, that I've done over the last dozen years or more has been in low and middle income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Asia Pacific region, uh, in the Middle East. And it's on behalf of the folks up at the top, the donor community, uh, PEPFAR, the PEPFAR program. PEPFAR is an acronym for the US government's uh, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Very large program, uh, $7 billion US per year, uh, working in about 53 countries. And I've done boots on the ground work for them um, in a number of countries. WHO work, UNICEF work, uh, the Asian Development Bank, I was an advisor to them for three years, as well as being uh, um, a teammate on a malaria elimination program in the greater Mekong, which is uh, Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia, and Laos. Um, and I'm presently doing some World Bank work in uh, Cambodia and developing a toolkit for people that develop national digital health uh, implementable blueprints. So there it is. That's a little bit about me. I'm, I've got, as I said, a bit of a geeky side. I'm going to leverage some of the work that I've done in low and middle income countries to give us a, a contextual story that we can get started with. So let's talk about the challenge that we're trying to address. And I wanna use a story to frame this challenge. So I wanna introduce you to a young woman, her name is Kenya. Kenya is 15 years old. She lives in a low income country in the Asia Pacific region. And in her country, one in six girls uh, are married before the age of 18. And she's one of those. Uh, Kenya is concerned by her husband's high-risk behaviors, and she's worried she might have become infected with HIV. So she attends at a VCCT clinic. That's a voluntary confidential counseling and testing clinic. Unhappily, she learns that she is in fact HIV positive. Sometime later, as a further challenge, she finds out she's also pregnant. Now, in her village, there's a community health worker that notes that, that she is pregnant. This community health worker, these community health workers are typically um, volunteers. They're not paid. But that's, that's how her, uh, the record of her being pregnant is noted by the CHW, the community health worker, who counsels her to go to the, the antenatal care clinic at the, uh, at the uh, district center. As an HIV positive mom, Kenya should be put on PMTCT, the Prevention of Mother to Child Transmission Protocol. Under this protocol, she would immediately be put on antiretroviral medicines. But to ensure that this care guidelines being followed, we have data that we need. We need to know that the people at the district clinic are aware of both her pregnancy, that'll be pretty obvious to them, but that she's HIV positive. If the data connections are all made, 
then the antenatal care caregiver at the district clinic puts her on the PMTCT. She's put on antiretroviral medicines. The PMTCT protocol includes specific instructions regarding the birth and postpartum management. There's a lot of blood management they do during the birthing process uh, to try to prevent infection of the baby. Uh, and when Kenya's son is born, the guideline is that he would be immediately tested for HIV. And if he's positive, he would also be put on antiretroviral medicines. But again, in order for all of this to happen, well, as it should happen, there's data that we need. That's it. And the, uh, the PMTCT protocol um, will only be applied if everybody's aware that it should be applied. If the data connections are made, the guidelines are followed, and Kenya's baby will be tested and may also be put on antiretroviral medicines. Of course, if this baby is on ARVs, then we can't use any live vaccines, so it can impact the vaccination process that all babies are going to go through. So the key takeaway from this is that these may well be happening in different places with different groups of people, but they are not isolated events. For Kenya and her baby, this is an arc of a health story and good outcomes rely on care continuity. And just to put that in perspective, if Kenya is put on PMTCT, the likelihood that her baby will be born HIV positive goes from around 35% to under 2%. So this care continuity has a big impact and it relies on information sharing across their storyline. For years, the donors that, I, that I've worked with invested with ministries of health in digital systems that would measure aggregate indicators. They were really doing a lot of indicator reporting. They would be putting up websites so that people could key in the number of babies that were born in, in the facility or the number of people that had an HIV test and so on. These aggregate indicators let us measure a care cascade. And in fact, this is the care cascade for HIV. So for the number of HIV pregnant mums, this is showing how many would know their status. Of those that know their status, how many are on antiretrovirals. And of those that are on antiretrovirals, how many had the PMTCT protocols followed? And then how many had the baby, uh, the baby's PMTCT protocols followed as well? And Sadly, in the country that she lives in, and these are actual data from two years ago, in the country where this fictitious person lives, where Kenya lives, half of pregnant women know their status, one in seven are on antiretroviral medicines. After birth, only 5% of the HIV positive mom's babies are also tested for HIV. And that re represents a 95% care gap. We're getting it right one time in 20. So the key to addressing these glaring gaps is to make digital health investments, not in collecting aggregate indicators, but improving underlying person-centric care workflows. So we need the, the challenge that we're talking about here, we need to shift the focus. We need to be investing uh, not in uh, indicator collection, but in supporting longitudinal person-centric guideline-based care across individuals' entire health journeys. This is a quote, you will not have more chickens by counting them more carefully. So if we think of any system, that's the black box there. You, you will not have more chickens by counting them more carefully. At some point, you have to become a better farmer. Walter Tate was uh, my grandfather on my mom's side. And what this is pointing out are some of the truths of systems engineering. And forgive me, but I just wanna take you through systems engineering 101 in 45 seconds or less. In any system, that's the black box, there are measured outputs and unmeasured outputs. There are controlled inputs and uncontrolled inputs. And by definition, if we're taking a, a signal from a measured output, and using that to drive how we control the inputs, that's by definition feedback control. The corollary to that that many people don't know about is feed forward control. And that's where we're collecting content from either uncontrolled or controlled inputs and using that to drive a control action. Uh, if you think about it, we use uh, 
well, actually, my little uh, my little character there is thinking of the bathtub. And when I teach this, that's how I teach it. If you have your hand in the tub and you're adjusting the faucets, that's feedback because it's a measured output of the system. You're measuring a system state, the water in the tub. If you have your hand in the stream and you're adjusting the faucets, well, that's feed forward because you're measuring the input. You're not waiting for it to have an impact on the temperature of water in the tub. You're making adjustments in, in advance of that. And I have no idea whether this is true for any of the other people on the call, but if you have a baby in the tub, you always make sure you're doing feed forward control as well as feedback control, because you never want scalding hot water to be going into the tub with the baby. So that's systems engineering 101 using the bathtub analogy. Here's some key takeaways. Over the last number of years, digital health investments in low and middle income countries, that's what LMIC stands for, have predominantly focused on indicator reporting. And it is true, you can't manage what you can't measure, but measuring should not be mistaken for managing. The behaviors and the outputs of any engineered system are impacted by its design, its uncontrolled inputs, and by the control actions that are exerted by the controlled inputs. And lastly, as a key point, we will improve health by improving healthcare. Now, I'm gonna pause for just a second in case anybody has a question about this. Um, and then I'm gonna get, I'm sorry for that much preamble, but then I'm gonna to start to get into the, the meat of my, uh, of my presentation. Are there any questions? And I just gonna set myself up so I'll be able to see if there's a hand raised. I don't see any hand raises, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to sing out. If not, I'm going to sally forth. Uh, I have four big, uh, big messages for today. The first one you've heard, you will not have more chickens by counting them more carefully. The second of my big messages is that digital health is an industrial engineering intervention. It is not a health intervention. And to be honest, I may well... Uh, be a contrarian with, with some of my, uh, my digital health colleagues on that point. But digital health, in my view, is an industrial engineering intervention. I'm going to say why I think that is. Quality is a process measure. And success comes from maximizing the amount of care we deliver in the green zone. And I've got a graphic that will show you what the green zone is. And the last point that I want to make, and this is something, again, influenced by how much work I've done in LMIC settings, Scale is the innovation. Uh, and if you think of it that way, you really are gonna have to design something that can go to scale and going to scale in a low resource environment is not, a, is not an easily done thing. You have to design for implementability and to ensure you're going to get the network effect. All right, how does digital health impact upon health? Uh, Please bear with me for just a moment. This is pretty simple if we step through it. Health interventions yield population health. That's fairly non-controversial. Digital health infrastructure operationalizes health interventions. Here's why, I, here's why I say it's an industrial engineering intervention. The health interventions are the health intervention. The role of digital health is to improve the repeatability, the consistency, the effectiveness, the efficiency, of the health interventions. Where we leverage digital health to do that, we generate person-centric transactional data. And here's where we get paid back for adoption of digital health standards. Because if these data are standards-based, they're in a computable format. And if they're in a computable format, then I can generate metrics from this person-centric transactional data. And I can choose to aggregate at whatever level I want. If I aggregate at the person level, well, that's by definition the longitudinal health record for that person. But I can aggregate at the provider level and use it to drive performance-based financing. I can aggregate at the facility level or the provincial level and use it to drive health system management decisions and resource allocation. And I can, al al I can aggregate at the national level and these become the reportable indicators that I'll submit to WHO at the end of the year. Now, these metrics can, can inform changes that I'm going to make. This is a feedback loop. 
to the digital health infrastructure or to the underlying health interventions themselves. Uh, we actually made changes to the HIV care guideline itself based on data that PEPFAR had been collecting during the first four or five years. If we look at this in a bit of a cartoon depiction, on the far right-hand side, we see the first of the four Ps, policymakers, payors, providers, and patients. That's the four Ps. Policymakers and payors will develop standard operating procedures that get incorporated into the digital health infrastructure. The digital health infrastructure supports SOP-based, standard operating procedure-based interventions in the care delivery network. These interventions can then be, um, the, sorry, the transactional data can be compared to what uh, is in the standard operating procedures. And that gives us a way to do health system management and look for adherence to guidelines, for example, as a useful metric that can be used to drive change. The person-centric data, we can do analytics on that. That can drive changes to the standard operating procedures. And now we've got this learning health system. And the more cycles we do in this learning health system, this continuous quality improvement, um, the better off we're going to be. So again, my key takeaways here, we can use digital health to both meter the system and to exert process control upon it. Digital health in that way is playing an industrial engineering role. It can be leveraged to improve our execution of the health production function. We should be leveraging digital health in support of workflows. Atomic person-centric data both serves care and population monitoring. If all we're collecting is aggregate data, we actually can't serve care. So focusing the digital health on the, at the atomic level, that's the smart place to focus it. Analytics can be leveraged to inform improvements to the overall uh, interventions. And this feedback loop is the, the learning health system. And there's some really terrific uh, literature about oh, 12 years, 13 years ago, published by the Institute of Medicine in the United States at, on the learning health system. Just a terrific uh, package of work that they did. Okay, that's a lot of setup. How do we operationalize feed forward process control in healthcare? Let's use as an example, HIV. I was for eight years an advisor to the PEPFAR program. Uh, in, I did boots on the ground work for them in a number of countries, but I also advised the program itself on how, um, on how it would make its investments on a, on a global basis. Um, any takers on what the 95, 95, 95 goals are for HIV? Anybody? Has anybody heard of that before? This to be a voice from the audience, no. <laughs> <laughs> so the 95, 95, 95 goals are the update of the 90, 90, 90 goals. And they are that we wish to have 95% of the people who are HIV positive aware of their status. And that's why this first one is above the, the VCCT clinic. We want 95% of the people who know their status to be on antiretroviral medicines. And we want 95% of the people who are on antiretroviral medicines to be virally suppressed. So ARVs suppress the HIV viral load and where the viral load is suppressed, your health is better, but you also can't transmit the disease to anybody else anymore. When your viral load is suppressed, you are no longer able to infect. And so this, uh, this set of targets reflects a person-centric care path. We want an HIV positive person to have been tested. We want them to be put on antiretrovirals and kept on those antiretrovirals. And we want them to be regularly having lab tests done to see what, what their viral load is. And if we're able to define that this is what should happen, then we can treat the absence of a signal as a signal. So if we know that Derek is HIV positive and should be renewing his antiretroviral medicines every two months, if it's been three and a half months and we haven't seen Derek, then we know what should happen and it didn't happen. And that can become actionable. So care guidelines give us a way to do feed forward process control. 
and it affords us a way to maximize the amount of care that is delivered in the green zone. So if you think of the blue circle as everything that should be done, and the yellow circle as everything that was done, then where the two overlap is the green zone. And that's where what you did do is what you should have done. To be honest, on the far left-hand side, we see that there's errors of commission. Clinicians don't actually have very many errors of commission. It's not that it never happens, but it doesn't happen nearly as much as errors of omission. By a factor of 10 or 20 to one, depending on the literature, uh, clinicians commit errors of omission about 20 times more often than they commit an error of commission. That's where digital health can play a very useful role. If we can define what should happen, then we can make very good, we can make very good use of our digital health investments. So let's play that through. HIV care guidelines describe what should happen. And if I have a way to ingest that into or reflect that into a computable care guideline for HIV, then I can leverage that computable care guideline to define what's the minimum data set that I should be collecting at each encounter, what's the workflow logic that I can drive off of that minimum data set, and what reportable indicators can be organically generated from that minimum data set. And now this, um, I'm, it's, it's it, the work that I've been doing in the last five years has been using the FHIR standard, but now this FHIR-based representation of best practices for HIV care can be ingested by digital health solutions, and we can use that to uh, have broad uptake of evidence-based best practices across the entire care delivery network. And this gives us a way to exert this feed-forward process control on the care delivery network. And that gives us a way to maximize how much care is delivered in the green zone. Just to put things in perspective, between six and eight and a half million people die every year, not from a lack of access to care, but from receiving bad care. This is a study that was done in low and middle income countries. Um, our numbers in the US and Canada, we, or Australia, we wish to be higher, but we've got a real challenge around adherence to guideline-based care. There are some statistics out of the US that were published not so long ago. 100% um, of Americans think they're receiving guideline-based care and 45% of them are wrong about that. It's just over half the time that you're actually receiving guideline adherent care. This doesn't need to be fancy. And I, I like to show this because it's reflective of the fact that in many low and middle income countries, um, the fact that they are resource constrained, uh, it, it, necessity is the mother of invention. SMS reminders, simple text message reminders, reduce the loss to follow-up, that's what LTF is, for HIV patients, by between 35 and 50%. Now, if I'm on my antiretroviral medicines, these SMS reminders are just giving you a, a little tickle every two weeks, every four weeks. Hey, it's coming time to renew your antiretroviral medicines. I have lived in Canada my whole life. I have never had SMS reminders for my medicines. This was something that was cheap, cheap, cheap. And it was an intervention that was, uh, this was reported from Eastern Cape province in, um, uh, in South Africa, in KwaZulu-Natal, where I, I, I did a bunch of work there. In KwaZulu-Natal province, the prevalence rate for HIV is one in three. So think of that, a one in three prevalence rate. If you were walking down the street, every third person you passed, HIV positive. Nope, nope, yup. Nope, nope, yup. These sorts of things, these sorts of interventions have a huge impact on the population that they're trying to help. All right, what are some of the key takeaways here? Smart digital health at scale helps care, care delivery networks maximize the amount of care delivered in the green zone. 
digital health solutions that can ingest and operationalize CCGs are the exact opposite of siloed care solutions that focus only on a single disease or care pathway. Um, I wanna dwell on that for a second. Where there have been investments in person-centric um, solutions, digital health solutions, I think of uh, the AMPATH project in, in uh, Kenya, for example. They've got hundreds of thousands of HIV positive people in a open source solution. It's based on something called Open MRS, Open Medical Record Solution, or Medical Record System. This solution doesn't do anything except HIV, which is unfortunate because you never die of HIV. You, it's, you always die of whatever it is that gets you because you're weak as a kitten because you're HIV positive and, uh, and, have, and your viral load is, has weakened you. But you'll die of TB or you'll, you'll die of, uh, of pneumonia or you'll die of, of complications from your, your diabetes. You're never gonna die of the HIV. So the idea that there would be a digital health solution that was siloed, that's the wrong thinking. We need to have digital health solutions that help care for the people. And nobody's defined in terms of any one disease or any one, or any one care path that they're on. A pregnant woman who is also diabetic should be also treated for her diabetes or who's also HIV positive should be also treated for HIV. That's the last point here. Multiple well-formed computable care guidelines can be concurrently executed. And this gives us a way to move to truly person-centric care. Most Canadians over the age of 65 have got multiple chronic conditions, which means more than 50% of Canadians over 65 have multiple chronic uh, conditions that they're being treated for. So this idea of concurrent execution, that'll be something that'll be important to more than half of Canadians over 65. This isn't a, oh, wouldn't that be nice to have? This is a must have. So uh, as I said, I've been involved in this effort for a, quite, quite a long time right now. WHO, the US CDC, AHRQ is the Agency for Health Research and Quality. It's a US agency. The Ontario Ministry of Health, I, I'm uh, dialed in from Toronto today. The Ontario Ministry of Health and others are actively supporting work on computable care guidelines. I think I said that WHO calls their CCG initiative smart guidelines. And when they were making their presentation at the last UN meetings, um, they named it as one of the pillars of their overall strategy. Smart guideline kits have been developed for antenatal care, for family planning, um, for HIV. And in fact, it was a Canadian team that did the work for the CCG for immunization. And at the time that project began, began it was focused on routine childhood immunization. And unsurprisingly, uh, midway through the project, they pivoted and uh, also focused on immunization against co or vaccines for um, COVID-19. I'm part of a joint Gemini initiative between uh, two standards bodies, HL7 and IHE, uh, to develop the core fire standards that are needed for CCGs. And our first version was balloted in 2021 and an updated spec is currently in ballot. Uh, there are a number of early adopter uh, countries that are updating their digital health strategy to embrace the use of CCGs. And I'm an advisor to some of those countries and I'm, I'm helping them navigate that work. Uh, both Linda and I know very well um, the teammates at the Asia eHealth Information Network and they have 22 countries uh, representatives from 22 ministries of health in that peer learning network, including India, China, and Indonesia, which between them, a billion and a half, a billion and a half, and about 400 million. So there's 3.4 billion people represented just in those three. And uh, of course, there's a total of 22 countries there. They have recently uh, done workshops and they as a peer learning group are adopting computable care guidelines. So this is an initiative I think that um, whose time has come and the important work that's going on in the standards side is uh, striving towards interoperable, consistently applicable computable care guidelines that will let us use our digital health investments to take best practices to scale. Now, uh, just because it's been in the news so much 
lately. I wanted to talk a little bit about what are the implications for artificial intelligence in this space. First of all, if we look back at our, our graphic around the green zone, pardon me, if we're, collecting, if we're collecting data across an entire care delivery network, there will be cases where something is being done that isn't part of the care guideline, but what if, because we're collecting all of this data in a computable format, what if we can leverage the very mature algorithms that we use for detecting credit card fraud, but turn them upside down? So these credit card fraud detection algorithms that have been used for decades are detecting negative outliers. When was your credit card being used in a way that isn't consistent with the typical pattern? The upside down of that is to look for positive outliers. What if there are some non-adherent care pathways that actually yield better health outcomes than when the guideline is being followed? We can leverage in the face of having big data that is well-coded and, and well-structured, we can leverage machine learning techniques to look for positive outliers. And those are candidates for a change to the computable care guideline. Now, by the same token, what if omitting some care activity yields either the same result or even better results? So that's a case where if there's something that is not being done, but it doesn't matter, or if there's something that uh, um, it makes it even better when you, don't, uh, when you don't undertake that activity, again, these are candidates for changes to the computable care guidelines themselves. And there are very simple AI techniques that will help detect these positive outliers. I also want to talk specifically about part of WHO's strategy regarding computable care guidelines. So firstly, WHO as a normative body publishes the care guidelines, they publish about 50 or 60 of them. So they have a normative care guideline for antenatal care, a normative care guideline for HIV care, for diabetes, for TB, for malaria. Um, these guidelines are typically, I don't know if you guys have ever had to wade through a Cochrane analysis, but these are very large, difficult to digest PDFs. WHO is doubling down on republishing or co-publishing all of their normative care guidelines as CCGs. And as I was mentioning, they've got five or six of them in the can already. The path here is that these global CCGs will be taken up by a particular country and nationalized, and that this nationalized CCG will then be adopted within the care delivery network and start to generate person-centric coded data. Now, it's a feed-forward process control technique, which is going to help improve the population health of this whole care delivery network. These person-centric data, we can start to do analytics on these, just as I was describing. And you can start to do big data analytics on these de-identified data sets to support continuous quality improvement, not only of the activities of the care delivery network, but of the CCGs themselves. Now, WHO has a digital health observatory, sorry, the Global Health Observatory, it's not a digital health observatory. The Global Health Observatory has aggregate data reported by every country on an annual basis. But what if WHO could get hold of these de-identified person-centric data sets? WHO has as their long-term strategy to do just that. So the computable care guidelines play a dual role. Firstly, to start to close what they call the no-do gap, the sometimes wide chasm between knowledge and practice in each of the countries that uh, there are the WHO members. That'll have immediate positive impacts on population health. But they also have this other goal of leveraging this digital health adoption to create large de-identified person-centric data sets that they can then start to do analytics on and use that to close the loop, to close the, to narrow the time span for the uptake of new innovations. Right now, sadly, the, the standard is that it takes 15, 16, 17 years for a new care innovation to become part of common practice. And what WHO is hoping is that these kinds of innovations can be uh, adopted to shorten that from 15, 16, 17 years 
to 15, 16, 17 months. Okay, because I'm on the topic of AI, uh, I'm gonna indulge myself a little bit further here. I gave a talk uh, at the end of May at our National e Health Conference on how, to, how we're gonna regulate AI-based SAMD. And SAMD is an acronym for Software as a Medical Device. And if you're gonna say something career ending, it may as well be at the end of your career, I suppose. Um, I ended my talk with a bit of a call out of ChatGPT because that particular AI tool has just captured the narrative around what we can what we can do with AI in healthcare. And I find that worrying. I, I don't think I'm the only one who finds that worrying. The hype putting large language models in healthcare has alarmed everybody who isn't trying to sell one. And frankly, even Sam Altman, who is trying to sell one, is a little bit concerned. So these are three articles that appeared in the weeks immediately prior to me giving my talk. One, um, a publication by the WHO. They put a press release saying they're calling for safe and ethical AI use in healthcare and calling for caution on the use of AI. Uh, the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, went farther and they uh, indicated that they believe AI poses a number of threats to human health and well being writ large. Um, they're very concerned about this hype and, and worryingly, how it's um, a disincentive for people to make good, smart, well informed decisions. And then the last one was. Uh, um, Sam Altman, when he was speaking to Congress, was basically uh, on bended knees saying, regulate us, please, because he must be a little more than a little bit concerned about some of the um, potential liability issues for, for them as a company if somebody did use chat GPT for health. And here's why I think it's worrying. So um, we know that chat GPT hallucinates. So would you ever consider placing this job ad wanted a well-read, highly articulate and persuasive advisor with absolutely no contextual understanding or actual domain knowledge and a propensity for randomly making stuff up for lying, including lying about the citations that support their arguments. Must be good at limericks. This is an unemployable person and we shouldn't pretend that this unemployable person uh, would be able to get the job just because it's cool that they're an AI bot. I literally cut and paste from Entrepreneur Magazine, the text you see on the left. And verbatim, it reads, the capabilities of ChatGPT as a generative AI-powered chatbot are vast, making it an invaluable asset in healthcare settings. Some of these capabilities include answering patient queries and providing relevant information, assisting in scheduling appointments and managing reminders, providing support for healthcare professionals in decision-making processes. Now, I paste that onto the right-hand side and everywhere that it said healthcare, I put in air traffic control. So answering pilot queries and, and providing relevant information, assisting in the scheduling of landings and managing instructions. How dangerous could that possibly be? Providing support for air traffic controllers and their decision-making. If you think of something that's hallucinating their way through a shift as an air traffic controller, it suddenly doesn't seem like a very good idea at all. And I, I want, people to use that as their test. If this seems like such a great idea, can we use it for air traffic control? Because carefully said, and I don't mean to sound crass, you can only kill about 800 people at a time in an airplane, but we have a million diabetics in Ontario alone. And if we're going to start instructing, uh, you know, informing care pathways using a hallucinating chatbot, that's just nuts. And this was something I tried to put as a joke at the end. Um, if it walks like a duck and swims like a duck and quacks like a duck, maybe it's a rabbit. Um, I then updated with some post-conference notes. So there were a lot of vendors who were showing 
chat GPT based capabilities at the trade show. And I just wanted to try to soften things a little bit. I think there's a huge opportunity in healthcare for transparent generative AI, not the black box stuff, the transparent generative AI algorithms that don't hallucinate. And such products can definitely meet the criteria, the regulatory criteria for AI based software as a medical device, which by the way is regulated in Canada, in the EU, in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Japan. There's a lot of countries that are signatories to that, that regulatory framework. Chat GPT is not medical grade, but it can potentially assist in use cases that don't meet this criteria of SAMD. Hype is not healthy for the digital health marketplace. There's serious work to be done by serious people and the fever just makes it harder for these serious people to do that serious work. And importantly, and this is probably what Sam Altman was looking for, the regulators need to quickly set the corner flags of the AI playing field, especially for healthcare. This will address the significant litigation risk that market players need to know Need to, need to know about. They need to be able to make informed decisions regarding what is in bounds and what is out of bounds because the, the litigation risks are just off the charts. Okay, I, I wanna to return to my four big messages. You will not have more chickens by counting them more carefully. Digital health is an industrial engineering intervention, not a health intervention. Quality is a process measure and success comes from maximizing care that's delivered in the green zone and computable care guidelines have a, fu a fundamental role to play in that. And then lastly, scale is the innovation designed for implementability and to assure the network effect. And the last thing I want to um, leave you with, I have to admit to you that the work I've been doing for the last dozen years or so in low and middle income countries in the, in the profession that I love has allowed me to work in the very center of this graphic. And I just want to give as a piece of advice, as I'm kind of nearing the end of my career, find what you love, find what the world needs, find what you do well, find what the world will pay for. And the overlap of those four Venn diagram circles is just where bliss is. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs>